connector. Perfect. So let me move on. There we are. So Saving Britain's Curlews by Mary Caldwell. We're really delighted that she's agreed to join us this evening. She's an environmentalist and freelance producer and author who has previously worked for the BBC Natural History Unit. Her first book was about the Scottish American naturalist John Moore, and then in 2016 she did a 500 mile walk to raise awareness of the endangered status of the curlew. Two years later, her book Curly and Moon appeared, which I know some of the members have kind of been talking about that and really have enjoyed, an account of the walk and the plight of this wonderful bird. Mary's an influential conservationist and she's received various awards for her work on issues. She's also led the campaign to have natural history included as a GCSE exam. And we're delighted that that's, you know, that before but too much longer, that's actually going to be in place. So I'm going to close my screen off now and I'm going to pass you over to Mary. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. OK, just bear with me while I do this bit. Here we are. Can everybody see that? OK, that's all come up. OK, has it? That looks perfect, Mary. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hello, everybody. What a fantastic audience from America to Northumberland to down in the southwest. Amazing. Very nice to see everyone. Um, OK, saving curlews. Uh, there it is. I don't think you have many of them in London. So uh, but I'm sure being a natural history society, you're all very aware of this absolutely wonderful bird. Um, it's uh, it's quite a, a secretive bird. It's it's a sort of enigmatic sort of bird, but 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 it does uh, it does incite people quite to, to sort of love it. Really, there's something very wonderful about a curlew, about the way it looks and the way it sounds. And so, although probably it's not a bird you can get very close to, or you know you can get you can see all year round or anything like that, it does sort of get 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 us to love it and I think that's rather nice really certainly certainly got under my skin uh, and I was thinking today that if I'd known uh, what journey the curlew would take me on being involved in its conservation um, would I have still done it because some of it's been fantastic and some of it's been quite scary and some of it's been full of conflict um, it's taken me on the probably the most exciting journey that I could ever have imagined and it still is on that so I'd like to thank you to say thank you to this bird um, and hopefully I can convey some of that journey today so there we are I'll run through the basics of what uh, the curlew is and its status and the threats to it some of the basic things that we're trying to do to protect it and some of the new threats that are coming up and uh, I'd be really interested to know your thoughts as well so let me move on. There we go. Numenius Alquata. Numenius, that's its Latin name. Um, Numenius means new moon, and Alquata means shaped like a bow. And so both those parts of its name refer to its um, absolutely beautiful long downward curving bill, uh, which is very sculptural and very distinctive of the curlew. We think it's very long. It's actually not at all the longest of the curlew family. The long build and the eastern curlews bills are much, much longer. Uh, I think they're absolutely magnificent creatures. But the Eurasian curlew has got a very big nose, that's for sure. And it's very beautiful. But let me, first of all, ask you on this rather November, rainy and cold November evening to, um, to kind of shut your eyes for a minute or just sort of shut out the world. And let me take you to where the curlew is in the spring. This is probably some of the most beautiful sounds I think that we have in the spring. Um, and, and just let this sound transport you to those meadows and moors where you see them most of the year round in the breathing season.
Can't really talk about the curlew without listening to the sound, can you? Um, and that is a very special musical sound. From the way the curlew's voice box and, and, and throat works, it kind of interweaves the, the major and the minor keys. So that sound is at once happy and sad. It's, it's a very emotive, very emotional sound. We can't quite work out whether it makes us feel happy or whether it's very melancholic. Um, and I think that's part of its charm, as well as that wonderful trilling and the piercing curly calls. They are the quintessential sound of the wild to me. Uh, well, we've seen you. We don't want you again. There we go. All right. So this is its range. Um, it's the Eurasian curlew, so it goes right across from the west coast of Ireland right away through to the far east, and you can see the eastern part of Russia there. The, so the yellow is its breeding range, and the blue is the wintering areas. But the birds that we know will uh, tend to just stick over in that the western area. Some of our birds winter down in the south in in France, and maybe go down to North Africa. Um, but it's the other curly, Eurasian curly that go to these other places in the east. So it's very widespread. Uh, population estimates are very old now for the European population. Uh, originally, they were about a, a thousand, I mean, a million. But, um, you know, I'd be very surprised if it was that number now. But the best time by far is to see the, is the curly is now in the autumn and winter months, because our population, which is around about, uh, the BTO says the most recent population estimate for the UK is 58,000 pairs. Um, we swell by 150,000 that come over from Europe in the autumn and winter. Our winters are much milder than they are in, in Northern Europe and right across that Western part of the continent. And so the birds, as, as many other waders do, come to our shores and the Western European shores to spend the winter months. We have lots of mud. We don't freeze over that much. The ground is softer. And so we get this great influx. So very often people say to me, I, I, but I see so many curlews. And I've, I've had so many photographs sent to me, which is really lovely, just in the last few weeks saying, look, I think there's curlews around more than you probably think. But most of those will be European birds coming over to spend the winter with us. But numbers are absolutely no guarantee of success. 150,000 birds coming to us in the winter might sound a lot. 58,000 pairs might sound a lot. <coughs> a million across Europe might sound a lot, but actually it isn't. We've already lost two, European, uh, two uh, curlew species. Uh, there are eight in total. We've already lost two, the Eskimo curlew and the slender build curlew. The Eskimo curlew uh, was a North American species. Uh, probably at one time the most numerous water bird in the world. And the slender billed curlew disappeared in the last 20 to 30 years, and that bred in the, in the steppes and wintered in the Mediterranean. Both of those, sadly, are no more. Uh, I'll just go back to the, um, that one, actually. The Eskimo curlew, the last photograph there was in 1962. There was uh, a sighting in 1963, um, but, but after that, there have been no more. And the slender bill curlew, I think, was in the 90s by the time that was uh, last seen. You can see the slender bill, the one, the slender bill curlew is the one standing at the back. It's got quite a thin, quite a shortish bill. The Eurasian curlew is the curlew in the front. So you can see the difference between the two there. Um, so sadly, we've said goodbye to these two, which is an utter tragedy. In, in North America, the Eskimo curlew, the, the streams of birds that were coming back from the breeding season in Alaska, heading down to South America, could be five miles long. But so many were shot, over a million a year were shot. Also, not just shooting, but also taking away the vast areas where they needed to feed. They fed on lots of little grasshoppers and um, all that scrubland was turned into arable farmland. And the, the, the combination of hunting and habitat loss saw the end of the Eskimo curlew. The slender bill curlew, I think we can pretty much put the reason for the extinction of the slender bill as to hunting. A lot, it probably was never as numerous as the Eskimo, but it couldn't withstand the hunting pressure. But back here, this is the wash. 
And this is where, as I said, you're most likely to see curlews at this time of year. And believe me, there are quite a few out there in that uh, picture. But being a sort of browny grey bird against browny grey mud and browny grey water, they're not that sort of obvious to see unless you get your eye in, even though they are quite big, about the size of a mallard duck with very long legs, I suppose. It's about the sort of size we're looking at. Um, and you'll see them in the flocks, doing that often that beautiful curly call that just sort of fires out over the water in the mudflats. Very beautiful. But come the spring, by about late February, March time, the native uh, British birds are heading inland to breed. The European birds, as I said, that have come over for the winter, they hang around a little bit longer, waiting for the spring to advance a bit more before they leave to go back to Europe. But our British birds will tend to come back inland. You know, sometimes we've had them back in the Seven and Avon Vales over here in the West Country as early as January, but we, we'd be expecting them around about the end of February, beginning of March. And traditionally, they're an upland bird. Most curlews are in the uplands and they nest on the moors and the, you know, the high ground um, and they lay directly on the ground itself. They don't really build a nest. They just kind of the, the, the male swirls around on his tummy and makes a bit of a scrape. And uh, the female lays three, but commonly four eggs directly onto the ground. They share incubation duties. And um, after about six weeks, they have their chicks. And then after about another six weeks, they fledge. So um, we do have them for a glorious three to four months inland. But something happened in around about uh, the end of the 19th century, middle to the end of the 19th century, we suddenly got an influx of curlews down in the south. They started to move south and east. They hadn't been recorded much before that in the lowlands, but something happened in the uplands. Uh, talking to Ian Newton, uh, the ecologist about that, um, he seems to think that probably it was the expansion of, of, of sport shooting in the uplands, changed the way the uplands were managed. The uplands started to be managed to promote more grouse, ground nesting birds. So ground nesting birds did well in the uplands and numbers just increased and excess curlews, if you like, if you like to think of it like that, started to expand down south and down to the east. That's one explanation if anyone's got a better one, but that seems to be the one that, that people are going with. And they started to end up down um, in farmland in the sort of old fashioned old McDonald's type farms we had before the Second World War and settled down really well. They found a really insect rich, soft soils, lots of insects, late mowing. Uh, they just found a really good curlew habitat and settled in very quickly. And it's amazing how quickly we accepted the curlew as being a farmland bird, really. Yet there isn't a breeding uh, record for the curlew in East Anglia until 1942, do you believe? So there, the curlew settled down in our old fashioned farming lowlands and did very well. And uh, we, we welcome into our hearts really, as well as into the countryside until the war changed everything, the world wars. And as we nearly starved in the second world war, there was a great push to grow our own food. And farming went from much slower paced, mixed farming, uh, late cutting, small scale, quite slow moving to the big fast industries, industrial type farming that we have today. Now that was a deliberate decision to, to increase productivity, to feed the nation. We asked farmers to do it, farmers responded. And we have now a much more intensive, much more concentrated system of farming. Small mixed farms are pretty rare these days. We tend to have big arable, big, big uh, livestock farms. Everything has gone much more segregated and larger scale. And that did not suit the curlews at all, I'm afraid. And alongside the changes to the farming practices, we've also seen in the 20th century an increase in generalist predators. Uh, we have the highest density, pretty much, of foxes and crows of anywhere in Europe. Um, since badger persecution stopped, uh, badgers have expanded. Since persecution of buzzards stopped, buzzards have expanded, stoats and weasels. So we change farming practices. The, the number of generalist predators increased across Britain. 
Um, we've also uh, a forestation um, took off and a, a lot of the breeding grounds, the curly, which are these upland moors, have started to become much more forested. That was particularly so in the early parts of the 20th century. And as we know, there's a big, a big move to plant many more trees now. So afforestation was another reason for uh, threats to the curlew. So um, habitat loss, uh, intensive farming, predation, all started to impact the curlew in big ways and numbers absolutely plummeted. So the UK has lost now it's over half of its breeding curlews in 20 years. So you can see that map there. Look at the massive decline of curlew numbers from the BTO, breeding bird index, and the change in abundance in the map in below. You can see the sort of rapid, rapid decline. We lose, we've lost around about 120,000 birds, which is 5,500 birds a year. Uh, making in 2015 the Eurasian curlew the most pressing bird conservation priority in the UK. This paper came out in December 2015 and I think it took everyone by surprise. This paper was only came out in British Birds, it was of interest to conservationists and scientists, but this fact wasn't really taken on board outside more generally in the general public. It tended to be something that specialists were looking at and worrying about but the rest of us kind of, it was passing us by, I suppose. But this is the reality. Let me give you some heart stopping statistics. So in the same time period, since the 1980s, Ireland had a minimum, a minimum of 5,000 breeding pairs. The latest count this year is about 120. That's a 98% decline in curlews in Southern Ireland. Northern Ireland, has gone down, they have the RSPB there looking after some reserves. We're probably hovering around about four to 500 pairs left in Northern Ireland. Wales, nobody really knows the number of breeding pairs in Wales left. It's gone from about over three, three to 4,000, probably down to about 400. Um, and in Southern England, we have about um, 30,000 pairs in England as a whole. Most of those are in the North. We have about 500 pairs of curlews south of Birmingham. So pretty dramatic declines over the past, since the 1980s. So change in abundance, as I said in that map below, just look at the difference. Uh, the deeper the red, the more abundant there are the curlews. So you can see the central uplands, the sort of the Pennine Way up into the sort of highlands of, and moors of Scotland. Um, that's where in between 2008 and 11, that's where the breeding abundance was. But look at the change in abundance. Just look how dramatically, look how much we've lost. Look at the car crash, which is Southern Ireland. Look at Wales. And even in the heartlands, numbers are failing and pretty much disappeared from many other areas. Highlighting major areas of loss. Graham Appleton from the BTO. Um, who won't work for the BTO um, and is a, is a mathematician as well, uh, did some calculations. And he reckons that just to hold the population steady as it is at the moment, uh, we need to be producing 10,000 more chicks a year than we actually are. So we're, the breeding success is so low with curlews, it's plummeting so dramatically that we need to, to just produce 10,000 more chicks a year just to keep hold the line. Adult survival is pretty good. Once they reach adulthood, they, they're doing all right. We cannot get enough chicks away. It's the breeding season, which is the bottleneck. They're just not enough chicks surviving. The nesting places are going, eggs and chicks are being predated. Um, the whole thing, is geared against curlews not breeding successfully. And that's why we've seen these declines. So 10,000 more chicks a year, please. If anybody could muster a few of those, that would be great. Which meant in 2016, um, once that paper came out, it's a bird I've always loved and grew up with. I grew up in the Staffordshire Moorlands. I set off on a 500 mile walk. That's me heading over on the, on the ferry to Ireland to begin. Um, and I decided to set off on April the 21st. That was my first day of walking. Um, because it's the first laying date of curlews, uh, that's when they roughly, uh, in the average laying date in, in our part of the world, 
And also it's the feast day of this rather magnificent looking chap, um, a saint in a boat called St. Baino. And legend has it, he's a Welsh saint, and legend has it he was sailing off the coast of Wales and he was going to go and preach and he dropped his book of sermons into the water. And, a, and apparently a curlew flew out from the shore, collected it and took it to the shore to dry. Um, the, the St. Baino was so delighted, he blessed the curlew and saying, may your nest always be difficult to find, may you always be protected. So I reckoned that St. Baino needed a bit of a to refresh on that blessing because uh, in the last 20 years, that seems to have not worked so well. So good old St. Baino, uh, we could do with a bit more of his influence, I think, at the moment. So that was the route of the walk I did, basically from the Northern Ireland. I, I saw the RSPB projects there, then went over to Sligo, was down to Dublin, went over, walked through Wales, did a dip down to Shropshire, and then walked straight through England and ended up on the wash. And the reason I did that transect uh, was because I wanted to go where the birds had disappeared, where they were, the fields were now silent, where people still maybe just had about had memories, but that was all. But I also wanted to go to where they were just about hanging on, to where people were doing good work, really trying to keep the birds going. And I also wanted to visit some places where is their heartland still, where you can still hear them singing. And that seemed to kind of cover most of that. And it took me through all sorts of terrain. And this is in, uh, in Southern Ireland, the absolute devastation of the peat bogs where they used to nest, 99% loss of raised bogs in Southern Ireland. Um, it's stopped now, but only in the last year or two, these precious resources, these inland raised bogs where so many waders, not just curly bread, were stripped and fed into power stations. Perhaps one of the most inefficient ways to produce power and saw absolute devastation to ground nesting birds. But it also took me across to the other problems seen in Southern Ireland as well. Silage cutting, as we said, forestry, drainage of the land, uh, lots of intensive farming, pesticides, and that kind of thing. So there I am, going through all these different terrains and ending up at the wash at about six weeks later. And I really did see the sort of the landscapes of Britain. I talked to everybody. I talked to scientists, farmers, conservationists, poets, artists, bird watchers, anybody that would talk to me, uh, to build a picture of what what was happening to the curlew and the effect curlew has on us, the cultural side of curlews. And that was what the walk was about. And Curlew Moon, the book that Anne kindly mentioned, um, that was kind of mentioned at the front, um, uh, yeah, is, is the detail of that walk and what I found. And when I got back, immediately, I started to organize four national conferences. So I got back in about June of 2016, by November 16, top left, was the first Irish Curlew Conference. Um, and together with Birdwatch Ireland and the equivalent of the National Trust in Ireland and um, Barry O'Donoghue from the National Parks and Wildlife Service, you know, a few of us got together and put on the first Irish, all Irish um, Curlew Conference, out of which came the Irish Curlew Task Force. Bottom left, we had a Southern English Curlew Conference at Slimbridge, um, out of which came uh, the Curlew Forum, uh, which I can tell you more about. Uh, bottom right, the All Welsh Curlew Conference, out of which came uh, Curlew Wales, and top right, the Scottish Curlew Conference. Um, they'd already set up something called Working for Waders, and Curlew got a bit of a boost in that. I also set up World Curlew Day. Put this in your diaries, folks, April the 21st, every year. That's when uh, a day set aside just to celebrate curlews. Have a coffee morning bake some cakes, give a talk, go out and see one, um, invite someone to give you a talk about them, do anything, you know, post online, put some photos out, whatever it is. But um, that's a day to keep the curlew in the public eye. World Curly Day, April the 21st. And my lovely cousin in Ireland designed that logo, isn't it lovely? And the way you do, um, you set up a World Curly Day or a World Day for anything is you just tell people it's World Day. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, it's fantastic, there's a World Curly Day. And, um, and it kind of took off. So we've had some really good and increasing number of, of things happening on World Curly Day. And it's really useful.
because it gives you some a peg to hang something off. So you can have an event and, and, and there's a reason for having it. They're really useful days, these world days. We also went and had a meeting at 10 Downing Street. Look at me. Um, I happened to meet, uh, Theresa May was Prime Minister then in 2018, and she had a, an environmental advisor, Lord John Randall, and I happened to meet him at a meeting, and he said, well, let's, uh, let's, let's have a meeting at Downing Street, and let's get some politicians and policymakers and scientists together from all the nations, and uh, there's a few of the partners in crime there. And that was a very useful meeting for putting it on the sort of political radar and also to get the national agencies, Natural England, NRW, um, and so on, uh, on board and working together. And then Prince, sorry, King Charles. King Charles also held two of his own curlew symposia. King Charles absolutely loves curlews, who knew? And, um, and he organized one meeting in a hotel in Dartmoor and a second one at Tygrove and, um, and urging people to get together. He said, please get together, uh, make this work, you know. And, and it took his influence really to get the big NGOs to come round a table together and say, uh, yes, we'll all work together to try to help the curlew because the situation is so serious. So the Curlew Recovery Partnership England was formed 18 months ago. Um, the founding sort of steering group members are all there, Natural England, Game and Wildlife, Duchy of Cornwall, RSPB, BTO, WWT, Curly Country, which is a Shropshire project, Bolton Castle, which is a grouse moor up in Yorkshire, Yorkshire Dales, and my own little charity, which I started um, in 2020, uh, Curly Action. I'm the chair of the Curly Recovery Partnership, and Professor Russell Wynne is the director manager. And we work together as a round table uh, getting people together to do lots of initiatives, which I can fill you in more about if anyone's interested. But we work with people on the ground and, um, and work with um, government agencies and scientists trying to get to the nitty gritty of these really difficult problems that Curly face. So what are we doing? Well, it's as simple as putting up some electric fences around nests. That's a really important thing to do. Um, if, if predation, as we know, is such a big, a big issue, and if your major predator is something like a fox or a badger, you can keep them out by an electric fence. It's really an efficient way of doing it. it. It protects the nest until the eggs hatch. It doesn't really help once they hatch because curly chicks are incredibly mobile. As soon as, but within two days, they're gone. They're like little bolts, you know, they're little bullets out of there. And they just whiz off and, and they're self-feeding and then the parents constantly scuttling around trying to sort of keep an eye on them. But they won't stay within the sort of electric fence. But it does in massively increase hatching success, giving you more numbers and therefore more chance of success. And here actually is a curlew nest. Um, protected by an electric fence in this highly intensive farm landscape, this is Shropshire. You can see that all the pressures, the silage cutting, the sort of, the, uh, the, the predators like the crows in the field there, you've got woodland there where foxes can breed, you've got a lot of intensive land use going on, um, but there is a protected nest, and there it is, protected there, there's an electric fence around that. But the harsh reality in this kind of landscape is that every year this nest is protected, four chicks hatched out of that nest, and within two weeks they'd all been eaten. Uh, and uh, not all of them, three were eaten and one was run over by a, a tractor. So they are, we are protecting them, but they're going out into a difficult world. Nest cameras are really another thing that we can do, put nest cameras right onto the eggs, so you can see what's predating them. There's no evidence that anyone has been able to find that's, uh, that, that the nest cameras are disturbing the birds or attracting predators in. Not yet, they, they, a lot of work has been done on this and there's no overriding evidence to say that's the case. Maybe one or two cases, but on the whole, the information we're getting back from nest cameras is so overwhelmingly important. Um, for example, there was uh, tens of nest cameras put up in nests in Scotland this year, 
working for waders, put lots and lots of cameras up on nests. And you know what they found the biggest destroyer of nests was, as they put it by a country mile in Scotland, it was sheep. There we were blaming buzzards and foxes and badgers, but the biggest predator, and, and if you can call a sheep a predator, was sheep literally coming over, pushing the bird off the nest and eating the eggs. It's not accidental trampling. This is, this is deliberate. And there's lots of film of the curlews desperately trying to sort of peck at the sheep, but they just come in and bulldoze it off the nest and they're eating the eggs. That might be a dietary thing. Maybe they're not getting enough calcium, but it was certainly a surprise to working for waders. And some of the footage is quite harrowing, actually, when you watch it. Who never think, when, who thought sheep were so, were so violent? But they can be, and it's been a real, that kind of information is literally invaluable. But we will also tell you whether your fox is the main, or a badger is, or whether it's a crow. And because it, whatever predator it is, you need to target that kind of protection. There's no point killing lots of foxes if foxes aren't the issue. And that would be wrong, ethically wrong, morally wrong. You know, you have to know what you're dealing with. And there you go. That's a, a screenshot of a sheep just about to throw that curly off its nest, by the way. The other thing we're doing is, is uh, increasingly, although it's not as easy as you might think, is using drones to find nests as well. Um, these drones have thermal imaging cameras on the bottom, and particularly in lowland areas where you have big expansive open fields like meadows um, growing, the grass growing quite long, it's really quite hard to find curly nests. You have to be a very good bird watcher. Curlews are very good at deceiving you as to where their nests are. They don't sort of you know, announce where it is. Um, you have to be able to read their behavior uh, and so drones have been quite useful. They're not perfect, but they could be quite useful in circ certain circumstances. And they do work. Uh, these were four known nests and um, the drone found all of them. So that it is useful, but it's not easy and it's expensive. And uh, if we've got any people who do uh, nest camera work, you know, with drones listening in tonight, I'm sure you can fill me on on, on a bit more information. But I do know it's increasing interest in it but there are problems with it the other thing that we can do in terms of technology is put thermal uh, loggers into the nests this is really quite useful this was done quite well in the new forest not very well in the new forest and um, lots of nests. they have about 40 pairs there um, and 19 nests they got data from so this is a thermal uh, detector put into the nest so you know when the nest is warm and when it's cold so this is a, a normal nest that went on to hatch. So you can see as the before the, air, the, the bird is sitting, the, uh, the, the nest goes up and down as uh, in daytime temperatures. So warm in the day, cold at night, because the bird isn't really sitting in it. Once it gets there and sits down for uh, incubation, the temperature stays pretty constant. And then after the, the sort of incubation period, and the chicks hatch and off they go, you can see the nest goes back to day night temperatures again. But this is a bird that was predated. Uh, it was, even when the incubation started, it was being hassled off its nest quite a lot. You can see it managed to sit for a bit longer and then it got, um, obviously got predated completely. And halfway through incubation, it went back to day night temperatures again. And by the, and you can tell what time that the disturbance happened. So early hours, you know, in sort of early hours of the morning, in the darkness, it's probably a mammalian predator like a fox or a badger. In this case, I think it was the fox in the new forest. So there we are, that's our chaps again. Um, ravens as well are, are an increasing problem in certain areas. Uh, again, a recovering bird from persecution. So you could see uh, the conflicting issues that we have here. Uh, these are native mammals and birds, uh, recovering many of them from persecution. Um, and yet, curlews are in such a bad state that any predation pressure is very serious for them. So nothing to do with curly conservation is easy. It's full of these difficult and, and angst, very often angst-ridden issues that we have to face. Um, also, Rachel Taylor from Wales, a scientist with the BTO, 
uh, was the first person to put tags, uh, GPS tags on breeding curlew. Uh, we kind of rings and flags and things have been put on uh, birds caught in the winter, but no one really knew how the birds were using the landscape in the breeding season. And Rachel's work and now others have, have, are finally uh, producing some really interesting results. We had no idea that curlews were such big travelers, even in the breeding season. When they start to arrive back, this bird flew 500 square miles around Wales, uh, going to all sorts of places before going right back to where she nested the year before. So they're traveling around a lot, which might mean that we're double counting. Um, because if you see a breeding bird coming back, you think, oh, there's one. There's probably a breeding bird. It might only be in your area for a very short time before it's gone again. So curlews, they found from all this tagging that they've done are great travelers. And even with a nest guard and mate and a mate to guard, they're off. And what they found as well is the non-sitting bird. So you've got either the male or female sitting on the nest during the night. The one that isn't on the nest can fly up to 10 kilometers away and go and roost by, usually by water somewhere um, before, and before coming back just before dawn. And we're learning all this by these, this technology. And then the one that everyone's so excited about, the big one, head starting. If you don't know what head starting is, it is a, it's kind of a crisis conservation technique. It was done on uh, black-tail godwits and, and mo most famously on spoonbill sandpipers. And it's, it's something you do when things are getting really desperate. You take eggs from the wild, all the eggs you can find, you don't leave any. You go, you find your nest, you take all the eggs away, you put them in captivity, you incubate them, you hatch them out and you rear them um, in pens um, and then release them back into the wild. So there we are, that's uh, collecting WWT, collecting eggs from airfields actually in England, uh, we discovered or they discovered that airfields, RAF, uh, military airfields were quite good for curlews, but they were destroyed under license because nobody wanted big birds flying around with aircraft about. And so when that was discovered, WWT said to um, the military, please, can we have those eggs? Don't destroy them. And they were really, really helpful. And so 100 eggs a year or something are taken off these airfields, raised in captivity, and then taken to various places to be released. The Seven and Avon Vales, Dartmoor, Norfolk um, are three of the places that have, that have used military eggs, if you like. Shropshire uses its own eggs um, that it gets from a few of the nests around there. And a project this year, the first time ever been done, uh, the Duke of Norfolk had started birds on his estate in Sussex, getting um, his eggs from his own grouse moor in the north. So head starting is a big sexy thing to do. And um, you can see these outdoor pens. These are the birds getting ready to fledge. That was just a few days really before they're taken to their release site and, and released into the wild, which is where they are there. So curlews, are getting lots of help. I don't know another bird actually that receives as much attention, political and sort of from, from the public and from and conservation as the curlew, yet still they are suffering incredibly in modern Britain. So it raises huge issues. It, it raises big philosophical uh, issues about have they a bird that's really just run out of time? You know, is it too difficult to hold on to them over most of Britain? Should we even be trying, you know? Or are they an indicator of good habitat management and that we need to use them as the sort of beacon to say, well, if curlews can survive in insect flower rich meadows in the south, cutting later, you know, working out the silage problem. If we can manage our landscapes so that the predation pressure gets less, you know, that so many other things will benefit. There's lots and lots of big questions. How are the new agri-environment schemes going to be used to protect curlews? Now we've left the EU. How do we view a curlew in Britain, you know, which will probably go over to Europe. We'll get a lot of European birds over here in the winter. These are European birds, not just British birds. It will force us to, or encourage us, not force us, it's with great joy to talk to our European 
neighbours about how we can work together to protect the coli right across its range. But for me, they are just a thing of beauty. They look beautiful, they sound beautiful. They're not economic. They don't come with a great price tag around their neck. They don't carry diseases. They don't, they don't do anything negative to us. They just fill our landscapes with very beautiful sounds. They, are, they, they, they do something to me which sort of sets my heart alight. And I don't want to give up on them and I won't stop trying. And I know that all the wonderful projects in the uplands and in the lowlands that are people really galvanized to help these birds and I'll just work alongside them as much as I can so um, in London it's there's not a huge amount you can do in central London but you can certainly help spread the word and support the projects that are out there so just in summary the threats to, to curlew are at the egg and, stick, and chick stage from farming practices, cutting silage from as early as April onwards, the intensification of farming, or in some places, land abandonment, where farms have given up and they're going over to forestry or they're just going to sort of overgrown or whatever. Predation is a massive, massive issue. Habitat loss is a massive issue. Forestry, increased leisure um, development, increasing housing development and climate change. All of these things are impacting on our beautiful Curlew. Curlew Action, my little charity, if you want to go and look what we do, Curlew Recovery Partnership, as I said, this round table of major organizations and what we're doing, those uh, websites will help you fill you in. Uh, that was my book, Curly Moon, that I wrote about them and a subsequent one on predators in Britain, um, Beak, tooth, tooth and Claw, where I look at this really complex and difficult relationship we have with predators. Um, and as I said, I want to thank the Curlews for taking me into uh, to, uh, to meet the now, you know, King Charles and, and the, the sort of great establishment of Britain, right down to the really nitty gritty projects that are happening at the ground level with just people working, people working on Curlews just because they can't bear to see them disappear. And that's been a privilege for me to be involved in that and to talk to you tonight. So thank you. And um, I'll, I'll, I'm happily answer any questions. I hope that hasn't been too depressing. There is hope, but do understand how serious it is for Curlies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That was just first so inspiring and quite sad at times, but also kind of the, you know, the message of that there are things that can be done and you just seem to have galvanized an awful lot of people. Um, and then obviously other people who are involved in it, but you kind of seem to have given it a real momentum that I think has been really kind of helpful. Um, people have pointed out that we do have, I think mainly as winter visitors, but we do get um, curlews along the Thames on the yes. mud flats, the places like rain and marshes. Um, they, I think not, you know, kind of not huge numbers. I'm not sure what the, you know, whether there's been sort of like a downward, I suspect a downward kind of, mm -hmm. um, trend in terms of numbers but it is you know I, and I'm not sure whether there are any particular kind of things going on at Raynham to support them but I mean somebody else in the audience might know about that but um yeah I think um, and the people were really quite moved by the video that you played and that kind of very haunting sound it is it, as you say it's incredibly evocative I've seen that there are some questions coming through in the chat. So if we can, so just to thank you once again for, you know, a lovely talk, but if we can go to a few of those questions. Anka, are you able to pick a couple of things up? Um, yeah, um, so they're actually quite um, divergent questions, but I'll just start off with um, Stephen and um, somebody else who, who, they were talking about avian flu. And so Stephen was wondering if avian flu is affecting the curlews and, um, and then somebody else was asking, can bird flu impact the conservation status of the, of the curlew? Yes, I, I don't know that of, of any problem with curlews and avian flu at the moment. Um, obviously it's a concern as these big winter flocks build up when you get thousands and thousands of birds together, um, but have not been flagged up to me. I, I haven't heard <coughs> from anybody that they're worried about curlews and flu yet. So. Um, you know, fingers crossed, <clears throat> they're one of these species that isn't too susceptible to it. There's a few aren't there. Um, so yeah, I can't really answer any more about bird flu, but as far as I know, not a major issue at the moment for us. Keep our fingers crossed with that. Yeah. 
Um, and Claire was wondering, uh, sorry, my voice seems to be kind of coming yeah. and going today, um, but um, Claire was wondering if there was a role for thermal imaging in finding nests. Yes, like we did with the drones, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, we put cameras, thermal imaging on the bottom there or and detecting the heat. So you fly the drone at around three to four in the morning when it's at its coldest and curlews are big birds. So you, you do get these nice big blobs of, of um warm bird to pick up. Not so successful with chicks because they're just a bit too small, I think, and they're a bit mobile, um, but it is a technology which probably could be developed and worked on a lot more. As I said, I don't know if there's anybody in the audience from the Seven and Avon Vales or anywhere that, that did that, but uh, thermal imaging is, is definitely a technique for some circumstances but you have to be, you have to get, obviously get lots of permissions and have a pilot license and fly at certain heights. And, and the crucial thing is to get the results back quickly. Uh, when it was first tried, the results were delayed in coming back. So we didn't get the results for a week to 10 days, something by which time the nest had been predated. So it was too late to put an electric fence up. So even though they found them, they'd gone uh, by the time we, we did that. So, um, if you are thinking of doing, are you in a project and are thinking of using thermal imaging, then just please get in touch with the Curry Recovery Partnership, I would suggest. Um, there's the, the, there's a, an email that's very obvious on the website and, um, and we can put you in touch with the right people if that's what you're thinking of doing. Cool. Um, and Roger was wondering um, if you could comment on the, on the onward success of the Head Started Burns um, that yeah. you discussed earlier. Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, don't we all want to know a lot more about that? So this is one of the problems with head starting. Um, it's a very, very attractive thing to do because it's a bit of a sugar rush, really. You know, you collect the eggs, you've saved them from being eaten. You've raised these chicks. They're all so fabulous and they're so sweet. And then you let them out and you've, you've got birds flying in the air and they're all calling around you. It's absolutely wonderful. But the problem with head starting is you've got to keep doing it and you've got to have the resources to monitor it. So um, it's difficult to get the licenses to do it. But one of the, the, the requisites now for licenses, is you have to monitor the birds because some head starting was doing and the monitoring wasn't done. So we simply don't know um, how, where they, how they've been doing. Um, those that we do know, some are coming back to where they were released from the Seven and Aiden Vale. Some are coming back but others have gone and joined other populations. So one of the head started birds has bred successfully in Oxfordshire, for example. Um, so they don't breed for two to three years and as head starting is a pretty re new technique for curlews, we're still early days. Um, but I think it's not an overwhelmingly obvious thing that's gonna save the curlews, it, it isn't. Head starting will not save the curlew. It will not give us 10,000 extra chicks a year, but it will help keep birds flying in crisis areas for a bit longer. That's the way to look at it. It's expensive, it's technical, it's full of, it's very hard work. They're really quite difficult things to raise in captivity. Um, and so, although lots of people say, I'd like to do it, our group would like to do it, you know, really is something you need to get a lot of advice on. And at the moment, although some are coming back to breed, the numbers are very low. It could be just because it's early days and it might be taking head started birds longer to get into the swing of things. They need to be with wild birds a bit longer to kind of learn the ropes a bit more because we don't know the effect of that. You know, uh, they don't grow up with adults uh, as the chicks do in the wild. So we don't know what information they're missing. Um, so there's so much we still don't know, but it's still worth trying in some circumstances. And why not? You know, these eggs on, on particular military fields are going to be destroyed anyway. So let's use them as, as the best we can at the moment. But it's, it's a very good question. And I wish I had a really obvious answer. I I'd love to be able to say yes out of 50 birds that were head started, you know, 30 about breeding, but that just isn't the case at the moment. And you can see generally how there's just so much points to the kind of need for more study, for more, you know, for monitoring, not only particular sort of interventions, but even sort of understanding more. I mean, the, the, the idea that the sheep are yeah. 
eating it. I mean, that is that I was completely <laughs> amazed by that. Because that would not have, yeah, I mean, but you know, there's only by actually kind of studying things carefully, yes. and putting cameras there and watching that you kind of learn, you know, most unex kind of unexpected kind of things yeah. can turn. And how easy it is to blame something, you yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. the data isn't there to support it. Yeah, it's no, so it's important that we know. On the other hand, you know, we can't monitor these birds to extinction, mm. you know, mm. you, there isn't the time. Um, we've got to do the science and the monitoring and we've got to do all that stuff that I was talking about with cameras and really get good bird watchers out there and so on. But we still have to do stuff. You yes, know. and some of it is just you have to, you know, you have to do some things that seem to make sense. Yes, and then rather than sort of wait until yeah. you're kind of really sure because they, they, you know, they can't, they can't, you know, this is such a big problem exactly. and the losses are so great that you know something has to be done in a yeah. time, you know, timely way. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I'm just popping in there, uh, Anchor. <laughs> if, if you want to pick a couple of, we've probably got time for two or three more questions. Well, there's, we one question, there's one question I think I would really like to ask. It's from Julia Black, because you've talked about different um, things that you guys have been doing in terms of head starting, in terms of monitoring. Um, and, and I think a question that a lot of us have is, what is the one thing I can do to help? The one thing that you can do to help is someone living in London. Is this a question from somebody, a, a non, a non sort of specialist, if you like? I, I mean, think just for the general public, possibly. Yeah. I'm not necessarily living in London. But. Okay, for the general public, just sing about them. You know, learn about them, talk about them, put something on on World Curly Day. Um, just get people to say it's amazing how many people don't understand what's happening it's not amazing it's complicated it's not amazing at all it's, it's taken me years to work out what's going on and I've done pretty much nothing else so it, it isn't amazing but people don't know um, and so get genned up get active and and if you can support charities or local projects you know that that need it either give to charities you know, that are that are sort of doing this stuff on, on a bigger scale or find out what your local group is and help support them. And sometimes uh, if you do live near curlews, if you're in an area where lucky enough to have birds breeding and there is a project, you know, maybe there are things you can do. You can get trained to go and help watch them. And um, there's lots of information that, that the Curly Recovery Partnership are putting out there. Another thing that I did was I started the Curly Recovery sorry, the Curlew Field Workers Toolkit, mm -hmm. which, is, um, which is an online resource which tells you everything you need to know about monitoring curlews if you've got them, what, what the bird behavior is, what you look for, what permissions you need, you know, what's the sort of, what are the, what are the techniques that you can use to protect them? That's all on the Curlew Recovery Partnership website. So there are lots of different things, but the, the public understanding, the spreading the word, the infusing about them, the going on your local radio and talking about them, whatever it is, writing an article, just posting pictures, it just keeps that profile up there. And that's really, really important. Uh, really, and it's the one thing that people, you know, that they think they've always got to go out there and start doing this technical stuff. You know, there are people doing that. What we don't have is enough people telling the world about them. Sounds, yeah. And I think, yeah, I think the first thing is go to the websites. Yeah, yes. Yeah, what, yeah. what information is there? Share links, like you said, share photos if you have them. Absolutely. Yeah. Read some great books on them. Yeah. <laughs> I hear there's a couple it. out. <laughs> <laughs> I could recommend one. Yeah. We will send out um, an email to let people know about the recording, but okay. we can pop this, you know, if you kind of want to maybe just kind of give us a, the list of some links, we can certainly pop those out and circulate yes, those. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll put those in the chat at the end. Yeah, that would be really helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Uh, Anka, do you want to, we'll probably just finish off with, I know we're, we're slightly over eight o'clock, but maybe just one last question. Um, well, just kind of going on, you know, along with the conservation, um, Janet um, was asking if there's a crossover with SNIPE in the conservation efforts. Um, SNIPE tend to, uh, yes, SNIPE, SNIPE and curlews quite often share not exactly the same places because SNIPE like it a lot wetter. Than, but you will in these, um, quite sort of higgledy-piggledy upland areas 
where you get wet margins and a bit drier and somewhere in the middle or something. Uh, you'll get the curlew in the drier bits and the snipe in the wet bits. Um, so any uh, we need wet ground, damp ground for both curlews and and for snipe, but snipe like it wetter. So they do they do like to be together, but they don't necessarily always go to the same places. But they're lovely too, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> another evocative and wonderful bird. Thank you. So I'm afraid we're going to have to kind of wind things up now. I know we could kind of carry on talking and I think people have been popping in the chat. I don't know if you see Mary about how much they've kind of appreciated the talk, thought provoking, inspiring. Um, one of the best talks that they've kind of heard. Thank so you very much, I think, you really, yeah, I think really people have really kind of been moved as and inspired by what you've been saying and I think you've kind of you've got a, a now a good number of people I think will go out and start kind of you know raising the profile of curlews even further which is fantastic thank you thank you so, yes thank you so much again you know we really really have appreciated you coming to talk to us this evening uh, I've got some people doing claps as well. <laughs> you can hear them, but, uh, yeah, we'll give we'll give people the chance to kind of say thank you at the end as well. I'm just going to um, finish off by letting people know that from the LNHS point of view, we'll, the recording will kind of go live in a, probably in a week or so, um, and we will send an email out. We'll send and we'll add those links.